All right, everyone, we are live. Welcome to the weekly Pond webinar for all of our favorite folks in the country, which are the nonprofit leaders out there. Um, I'm your host, Mitch Stein. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pond. As a reminder, we host these sessions every week, every Thursday, right here at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, and we cover a super broad range of topics related to the nonprofit sector. And we also reward anyone who joins and gives us some feedback at the end, you'll get 50 bucks in your Pond account. Maybe asking, what is Pond? Pond is an ecosystem built for the nonprofit space. We help connect nonprofit leaders with the tools, services, software, resources that you need and get paid along the way to engage to help lower the cost barrier of those solutions. So thank you folks for joining. Thank you to our panelists. I just wanna, before we dive in, absolutely acknowledge um, what's happening related to this topic of burnout we're talking about today in the country, not only this week, but in weeks prior, shooting in Buffalo, shooting in Uvalde. I think it weighs on all of us and contributes to the other factors of burnout in a tremendous way. So I just wanna encourage everybody that's entering this space and conversation with us to Let's take a deep breath. Like this is here for, for support and healing and, and strategies to, to manage through this, these hard times. Um, and even for folks that are listening, you are welcome to jump into the chat here in the comments, any point in time. Um, let us know how you're feeling. I mean, if, if there's one word you describe how you're feeling today, right now, how you're entering the conversation, if you can share that in the chat, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, just to know the tone of the group that we're bringing together today. For me, I'm just frustrated, not gonna lie. I'm, I'm extremely frustrated and that makes everything else harder. Um, and I will turn it over to our amazing panelists today who have such a wealth of knowledge and experience in this space. We are so lucky to have them. Please don't hesitate to get your questions into the chat while we have them for the next hour. Um, if everyone will go around, could just introduce you, who you are, what you do, um, and maybe just a few layers of your identity that are most important to you that you bring into this conversation with you. And uh, Phil, you're off here to my right, so I'll start with you. Uh, well, thanks, Mitch, and thanks for having, for both convening this conversation and including me in it. I'm Phil Shermer. I'm the founder and CEO of Project Healthy Minds, which is a mental health nonprofit that works with public figures to destigmatize mental health um, and builds technology that makes it easier for people to find the mental health services that they that they need. Um, you know, I think I, the last couple weeks has been, um, you know, definitely a journey for me. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, to answer your question, Mitch. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I belonged to Tree of Life Synagogue. I got bar mitzvah there. My parents still belong there. Uh, where the mass shooting was in 2018. So seeing the last 10 days uh, sort of brings back a lot of memories of four years ago and, you know, a, a combination of, for me, my own Jewish identity and sort of this intersection into. Oh, Phil, I think we lost your audio. Well, well, I didn't have, oh. keep going. You're back, you're back. <laughs> well, well. All, all I was saying was that um, the last few days reminds me both of my own identity as a Jew and, and also the intersection into these larger conversations about gun violence and discrimination and hate. So it's a really important conversation. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Thanks, Phil. Beth, do you want to go next? Oh, Beth, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Always, uh, I always kind of mute in case there's background noise. Uh, so my name is Beth Cantor, and I've worked in the uh, nonprofit sector my whole career, uh, last couple of decades. And I have focused on uh, workplace well-being and uh, digital transformation. I'm also an author. Uh, I wrote a book called The Happy Healthy Nonprofit, which is about workplace well-being and also how activists can take care of themselves. And grew out of my own personal experience with burnout. And uh, my more recent book is uh, uh, The Smart Nonprofit, which is a, a, a about adopting smart technology. And I guess the lens that I bring to this, um, like Phil, I also come from a Jewish background, but I am a third generation Ukrainian refugee. And so uh, 
so I'm really, so I, you know, seeing what was unfolding in Ukraine was also very triggering for me. And also having done a lot of work there, having colleagues and, um, and just sort of this feeling of helplessness. So if you think about what's going out on in the outside world, we have uh, racial injustice, <laughs> which has never stopped. It's only gotten worse and gun violence, uh, a war, and so many other things that are external things that are causing us stress and, and, and maybe causing direct trauma to people that we're serving in our nonprofits. So, so I'm glad that we're having this conversation because um, we have to recognize it and uh, we also have to address it. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Rach, do you want to go? Yeah. And sorry, Mitch, can you just repeat the question one more time? My dog was barking when you were at, asking us what you wanted no. us to say. No worries. Just introduce yourself, um, your role, and a few layers of your identity that you bring into this conversation. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, hi, everyone. My name is Rach. My pronouns are she and they. Um, I am the co-founder of You Good Sis. It's a wellness collective based uh, back in Boston, where I just currently moved from. I'm now based in Portland, Oregon. Um, we hold space for Black and brown women um, to really just have a space in wellness. My co-founder and I started this about five and a half years ago because we were the only ones in yoga studios of our skin color, of our size, of our hair, like very much felt othered in that space. Um, and uh, since about six years ago, we've been able to host um, about like 60 events, both in person, live stream, all of that fun stuff that we had to pivot to with COVID. Um, and I also have a background in working in digital fundraising via a nonprofit, um, as well as DEI consulting. Um, currently just, uh, I'm taking a break from a lot of that because I'm actually going to grad school in the fall for clinical mental health counseling to become a licensed therapist because that need is super <laughs> important. Um, so I, I would say that my lens I, I bring here um, is just kind of being able to see the intersections between uh, nonprofits working in a very high uh, pace environment when, we, when it comes to like politics and that onslaught of news that we see on Twitter all the time, um, as well as just building a, a healthy, healthy wellness collective <laughs> as much as, as we can uh, during these times. But I'm really excited to be here. So um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Awesome. Well, I'd love to just start off, and the conversation is obviously avoiding nonprofit burnout, but just to kind of set the stage, Beth, would you mind defining what does nonprofit, or sorry, what does burnout mean to you? Uh, sure. So I always like the uh, World Health uh, Organization's definition of burnout, and it's really, uh, it's working, uh, uh, it's workplace burnout, actually. Uh, so it's working too much with too little support and not enough recovery time to rest and uh, refresh. And when I used to, and I, I use that definition in the book. And when I was out talking, when I talk about the book, I read that definition and people say, that's like working for a nonprofit. Um, so, um, you know, there are the, the symptoms that emerge are, are, are can be physical, uh, mental, attitudinal, and also it impacts your productivity. Um, I, I think for me personally, it's that feeling of that there's no escape from existential anxiety around our work that, you know, that there's just no escape um, and, and that there's nothing we can do in the face of, you know, the things that are happening outside our world that we have no control over and, um, and any obstacles internally, whether that be a, a toxic environment that we're working in or just lack of resources or understaffed, long hours, you know, all those, all those things. Yeah. And I guess, Phil, I'd be curious as you think about the um, audience you're serving at Project Healthy Minds, who is likely to experience burnout and why? And, and are certain individuals more at risk to experience burnout? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, to take a step back, the the third leg of what we do is trying to create the first national standards around what businesses should be doing to support employee mental health. If you think about the relationship between the corporation and the worker on an issue like retirement planning, there's a very well-known playbook of what companies and nonprofits should be doing to support retirement planning, right? You create a 401k system. You use a cash incentive, the match, to encourage people to save. You auto enroll people. You auto escalate, and and companies and nonprofits can choose to be more or less generous along that spectrum. But people know what to do when it comes to the issue of 
mental health, whether it's for for profits or for nonprofits, you basically have the same status quo, which is for like 85 years, companies have relied on the EAP to check the box, the Employee Assistance Program, despite utilization rates between three and 5% in the United States. And if you've ever used the EAP, you know how terrible of an experience it is. And so what you have is, even for well-resourced public companies, a growing recognition right now that you have to go way beyond the EAP. It's one part benefits, it's one part workplace. And so the idea of like, how do we even measure burnout in the workplace for four well-resourced public companies or for nonprofits? Like most organizations aren't even doing that. So when you think about it sort of anecdotally, I would say everybody is susceptible to burnout. And if you think that you are immune to it, then um, you might have a little more reading to do. But I think sort of the question that every organization is going through right now, and, and Beth, I'd be curious to get your opinion on this, which is like, there is not the same mental model around how you actually support colleagues and, and employees on mental health and on preventing burnout as we have on so many other issues. We're just beginning to do the work that we really need to do. So I think it's sort of a pervasive issue, an underreported issue, and an issue that um, when you talk to people, everybody anecdotally says is, a, is, is important to them, but, but we haven't actually done the work to really identify with, with great depth sort of what is it that we should be doing and changing to, to help avoid and, and help people. And, and Rach, I'd love to hear from you. I know that you've created this great safe space for people. I'm sure you learn a lot about contributors to burnout that employers or managers probably don't even know because they don't feel comfortable sharing that at work. Like, what are some of those factors that you notice that you feel like need to be identified and, and named more? Yeah, I actually think um, Catherine in the chat box had said something really important that I want to uh, emphasize is that empathy, empathy fatigue is that um, you really do love your job probably because there's some ethos that this company has stated that you really appreciate that they're sending out cups to everyone in the world because it's a good mission, right? Um, but sometimes that mission comes uh, at a cost for your personal uh, health, your mental health. And there's this, uh, this new word that has been developed during the pandemic called languishing, where it's just like this wave of like, oh, yeah, I'm constantly tired <laughs> of doing all this. And something that we get time and time again in our events is people are just uh, they're just tired. Like they don't even know like what what does it mean for them to um, take a break? What does that look like? Because, you know, for about a year and a half, like we were very much confined to our homes um, to a screen for interaction, seeing maybe 10 to 10, 10 to 20 folks at a, any given moment. Um, and then there, there's a, that acknowledgement. Um, I think Beth mentioned this too, that we just don't even know like how to help prevent folks from kind of uh, getting to that point of burnout. So we can talk about like, great, we all have a work from our heads down Wednesday. So no meetings on that day, or like there are summer fun Fridays, or so Fridays, like you'll have no meetings, or there'll be the day off, or you can like, go off and do whatever you want. But that can also mean that, you know, the flip side of that, if we have, we're taking um, some free, giving them our employees some free time, then we're also putting a lot of more work on the days that they're actually heads down from like nine to five, or for some folks like eight to seven, whatever that looks like. Um, and not really understanding that um, to something that we've been seeing a lot in our You Good Succession is that, uh, is that a lot of people just don't feel like they have the space to just even ask like, okay, my capacity is X. I really need it to be Y instead. <laughs> it used to be a hundred percent, but really a hundred percent now looks like what 60% is, was back in like 2019. And we have to adjust those models. Um, and some people are afraid to kind of speak up because some people are really happy in their roles or happy getting whatever paycheck they're getting. They don't want to go back to this grind of searching for a job right now. It's relentless. It's a really tough field. Um, and there was a really good podcast that I'll make sure to mention this in the notes for the follow up um, that was done um, about the, the case against loving your job. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I thought that was such a great podcast uh, episode just about like, how much what that moral injury is that we subscribe to by working um, 
at a company again. And we really, again, like what the company is doing. We really want to be there to support our teammates and um, our employers. Um, but at what cost to ourselves? Is it really worth it? <laughs> If I'm sitting here telling you I'm really burned out, I'm really tired that I, uh, my, uh, the things that excite me don't excite me anymore, that I have to literally watch uh, past episodes of Parks and Rec just to feel some semblance of like happiness. Like, no, that's, that's not it. (laughs) Um, But yeah, ultimately, I would say that there's this need for more experience and knowledge about mental health in the workplace and what employers can do. Um, And it's not something that we should shy away from. I think we talk about this a lot in the DEI sector about what does it mean to bring your full self to work? Yes. And what does it mean to provide a space for your employees to be mentally well and not just with benefits? Because you can provide free Chipotle every day. But (laughs) what does that actually mean to make sure that the health insurance you have actually covers therapists in your network? Um, and not just like any kind of therapist, but therapists who are also black, who are also queer, who who are also Asian, like thinking of beyond um, just kind of the cookie but, uh, cookie cutter um, template that you may have. Hmm. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing, Rach. Um, Beth, I'd love to hear, you know, how I know you've spent so much time specifically addressing this in the nonprofit sector. And we've had some of these things come up about what's unique about the sector in relationship to mental health and burnout. Would you mind walking through some of the key things that you've identified in your work? Um, Sure. So I'll I'll start with this whole notion. I think Rach just alluded to it about um, passionate work. Your love's not going to, your work's not going to love you back. That's the title of a book. And uh, I think Erin Sinst, if I'm pronouncing her name, she's a researcher at University of Michigan, just came out uh, with a book called The Trouble with Passion. And basically she's kind of looked at this from a perspective that, um, you know, passion is kind of a capitalist notion and it's there to kind of hook us into our work. So we overwork and that we don't have this identity outside of work and that, um, and, you know, it used to be this kind of, you know, we want passionate people to come work for our department. So that's sort of like code <laughs> for we're going to, you know, you're going to work long hours without extra pay. And I think in the nonprofit sector, we just totally take advantage of people's passion for wanting to repair and save and change the world. And and also, I think, as uh, activists, you um, uh, you know, that are fighting for <laughs> women's rights, equal rights, for things that are wrong in our communities or, or in our world. Um, uh, you know, I think also we have been sold this notion that we have to give, we have to kill ourselves for that, um, or, or that we don't care, or that we should feel guilty if we're not working 80 or 90 hours a week and just ignoring our families and ignoring our health. And I really think we need to change that. And I know some activists get, I get into, <laughs> we get into disagreements or I, it's not that I don't care. It's just that I have to really shift and think about refilling my own cup, refilling my energy will help me do better to, to, to uh, sustain this uh, work that I'm doing. That's so important. And also when we're working with um, more, uh, pe- vulnerable populations, we have to understand that we can assume their trauma too. And we really have to have all the more important to have ways that we can um, build our resilience and, you know, at least take some breaks from this or else it just leads to that constant, um, you know, constant onslaught of this, you know, existential anxiety that I've been hearing about. I think also in the nonprofit sector, um, uh, you know, along with the great resignation, there's been uh, a number of statewide surveys that I've seen and also some at the national level that are showing a lot of people are leaving their jobs, <laughs> especially in the nonprofit sector because of low pay. That's been there. <laughs> we pay people terribly. We ask them to work uh, extra long hours and we create horrible environments for them to work with. So I heard I've heard from like social workers that are helping people who are, you know, homeless or or or, or addiction counselors. They're they're making less money than people who work at Target or Walmart. And that's just, there's just something not right about that. Um, somebody who is going for extra schooling. And we really, really need to change that. Um, and um, so that's it. I think, you know, the, the pandemic has actually given us this time to kind of like think about what's really important in our lives. Um, and uh, and uh, people who are working for an organization uh, want, you know, 
you know, what a really worth it <laughs> argument in some places, you know, and we really need to like shift and rethink our definition of productivity to really center wellness uh, in that or else it's just, I mean, it makes, it gives me existential anxiety if we don't change in this sector. Yeah. Phil, I, a lot, number of people in the, in the comments have brought up, you know, this toxic positivity. I think this shows up in both corporate and nonprofit settings for sure, because it's like, you can't really say you had a bad day. Cause does that mean I'm a bad employee? Like everything has to be great, you know? Um, and there's this real pressure to be positive. Um, how do you see that showing up and how do you see people effectively bringing the mental health conversation to the fore even when it comes across as like a downer if that yeah. makes sense yeah no totally well it's interesting I, I think that we you know we spend a lot of our time working with although we are a nonprofit, working with public companies that are trying to get from their back foot onto their front foot on mental health and I kind of feel like we're at the beginning of this era where CEOs and leaders view vulnerability as a strength and not a weakness. And, you know, for a very long time in finance and in a lot of the sort of traditional hard charging private sector sort of sectors, you would have industries, you would have folks that really put up a wall around what was happening in their personal life or with their family. And, and I do think that if you, if you look at, for example, the role the LGBTQ movement played in bringing your whole self to work, there's a lot that, for example, I think mental health learns from it. So the question is like, okay, well, where do you, the question I get all the time is like, how, how does one start? Where does one start? The answer is it starts with the CEO or the executive director. There's simply no way that you can build a mentally healthy culture if you do not have the leaders of the organization role modeling the importance of the issue, talking about their own experience. It doesn't have to be that they have a have a particularly deep story about depression, but everybody is connected. It could be your kid, it could be your best friend, it could be your parents, it could be a sibling. And if you're not leading with authenticity on the issue, then you're not basically signaling to everyone else, creating the permission structure for them to be able to open up honestly about the issue. And what we've seen is time and time again, whether it's sort of like celebrities in, in sort of popular culture or whether it's CEOs or, or executive directors, when people do that, you are shocked every time by the number of people who basically use that as an opportunity to come out about their own experience. And to me, you know, all of the trainings in the world, all of the, you know, access to meditation apps, all of the everything is, is nice. But what is fundamental is, can people even show up to the office and be honest about what they're going through? And everything else doesn't really matter to some degree, if they can't even bring their full self to work. That's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think the comment Catherine made in the chat here about funding limitations, it's a really good point, Phil, that that doesn't have to do with funding. You know, there are things you can do that don't have monetary costs that are actually the most important kind of foundational thing. Rach, are there other suggestions you'd make specifically for leaders who feel that own stress, stress and pressure on themselves about funding limitations of how they can take steps in the space that aren't going to quote unquote, break the bank. Yeah. And I think it's just from what Phil mentioned too, it's a, it's about moving from a place of intention to action. Like it's great that Headspace wants to have like this <laughs> corporate package to send to companies um, so that all their employees can access it. But ultimately it's um, you can, you can also just ask your team, like what's going on? Like, how can I help you just start there as important as it is for the CEO or the ED to model these behaviors. It's also good to kind of understand like, where are y'all struggling um, how can we make this structure a little bit better that may not sit in monetary uh, spaces? Companies having employee resource groups is also an easy low lift thing that may or may not require some money, depending on how you want to structure it. Right. Um, but just even providing spaces for your employees to kind of um, just kind of gather <laughs> and see see what they need. Uh, 
is ideal and not just taking that survey or that um, comment just to be like, okay, cool, we, we hear you, but also measuring it over time um, to make sure that you do have a happy, healthy workplace environment for people who not only want to stay, but um, for people who who do join, uh, that they can kind of jump right in and feel secure if something were to unfortunately happen as soon as they, they start working at a company with like another national tragedy or even a personal tragedy. They don't feel like they have to necessarily power through because the company has already modeled a space for them to kind of um, jump in. But yeah, I would simply say that it, it just really starts at just asking the people like, what, what do they need? What do you want? <laughs> How can we make it possible uh, without yeah breaking the bank? Um, and if it is something that does require some kind of funds, like what can we shift around to make it possible? Uh, and I would just, I would start, I would start there. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think one of the biggest mis leadership mistakes you can make is assum assuming things, assumptions. <laughs> and it's the same in your programmatic work too, you know, like bring that, bring that, what you know, in the populations you serve, needing to ask them what they need and trusting them when they tell you what you need. And I think it's sometimes I observe that as a challenge to bring into your own operations internally as a nonprofit, even though that's a big strength as an organization. Um, that how, if you're not in the leadership position, but you are a staff member, um, I've, I've spoken with, I can't even count how many people mm -hmm. that are frustrated because they feel kind of powerless in their organizations, big or small to make changes like these. What's your advice to people that are in that situation? <laughs> I, um, yes, <laughs> I've heard this many, many people express this, especially if they're not the leaders. And I'm just going to really emphasize and amplify what Rach just talked about is that importance of having leadership actually have a conversation with staff. And I like to structure it with, um, there are the five Fs of well-being in the workplace and they're F words you can say. And, um, you know, it's about functioning, feelings, friendship, forward, personal growth, and, and feeling connected to the mission. And just having a conversation that, um, about like what, what things could help. How could we Im improve this? That can do so much. And not just having the conversation, but actually following through with some action, e small steps. And it doesn't have to be expensive um, either. You know, it doesn't have to be catered organic lunches or, <laughs> you know, the, the um, you know, headspace. Headspace is great. But um, it could be even just having uh, appreciation for people, <laughs> right? Or having, having a, a, a meeting where people are reconnecting with why they got in the field in the first place. But to answer your question about, you know, what do you say to leader people who aren't the leaders and are in a toxic environment? Often I get people think they want to change it. And how can I change this? How can I go in as a warrior, and, you know, and change this? And I think it's really hard to do that unless leadership is backing that change. And uh, what I say to people is to think about, you know, uh, do, you, you do need to do some self, you know, advocacy with your manager, with your, you know, making sure that you have those one-to-ones, bring it up in the one-to-ones, take advantage of, of the support that's there, you know, maybe uh, that EAP program that Phil mentioned. But if you feel like it's just become so untenable and that it's not going to change and many times it won't unfortunately is that maybe you need to think about your exit plan and your exit strategy and uh and i've been saying a lot to leaders that your corporate brand really is your workplace culture and if you have a reputation for having a toxic workplace you're not going to be able to recruit the best talent that's out there and people are going to leave um in fact we're hearing i just saw there was a thread on twitter it was hashtag horrible bosses <laughs> and there's now been additional websites where people who work at different organizations, you verify that you work there and they talk very candidly about what it's like to work there. So work gets around. So it's really, really important that leaders understand this. And for somebody who's stuck in a toxic environment, um, unless there's a big change in leadership, uh, whether a different person's coming in or whether there's a change of heart of leadership, and that's rare, um, think about your exit plan. Yeah, I, I think what gets in the way for a lot of people that I've encountered in the space too is they view their, whenever there's risk, it's really tough. So if I speak out on this thing, um, there's risks. People might think less of me or maybe in the nonprofit space, you have this extra burden of external funders, donors, am I going to upset, upset them? 
And we had one question come up in the chat about balancing speaking out and sharing your heart and being more vulnerable. And the fact that our donor is going to doubt me, are they going to have issue with this? Actually, Michelle, next Thursday, this webinar will be about fundraising for controversial causes. So I would absolutely encourage you to join that session. But I would be curious, and, and I'm sure all of you have thoughts on this, but Phil, I mean, mental health stigma is definitely evolving, but it is not done. Like, how do you think about fundraising of something that's not like help the puppies or sick, you know, a sick children's hospital? Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, if you talk to sociologists when it comes to mental health, they'll say that, that stigma manifests itself in three, three different levels. One is the self, one is sort of the community, and one is through institutions, right? Like through discriminatory policies. And one of the ways it manifests, obviously, is mental health as a category, mental nonprofits, have been severely overlooked for a very long time. That's beginning to change as a part of the pandemic, but you're working off a pretty low base. And at the same time, the thing that that was um, interesting to me when I started into this work was, you know, the pre the prevalence. Just to, to give people a sense of it, when you think about the prevalence of mental health, there are four times the number of people in America with a mental health condition as compared to the number of people diagnosed with cancer. And so the number of families that have a connection to this issue is enormous. They may not talk about it publicly. They may be historically more likely to give to a cancer cause than to a mental health cause or to put their name up on the wall at a hospital in the psychiatry wing. You know, they may be more comfortable doing it on the cancer wing. But what I have found in my work is basically Anytime you're able to get one-on-one -on -one with someone, and especially if you can get the first person to basically role model, if you get a leader to role model, a Carson Daly, a Logic, uh, you know, some sort of CEO, um, basically everybody comes out of the closet about what their own connection is to the issue. And so this notion that being honest or vulnerable about your own mental health or like that the mental health category um, of nonprofits can't raise money, I think is BS. If you look at, you know, the our own board, for example, there are some folks on our board who have been involved in the mental health work in this country for decades. Um, and then there's a lot of people on the board who this is the first time they've ever been involved publicly in a mental health cause, but they all have a personal connection or family connection to the issue. And so I think sometimes what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that there is this idea that if you, if the cause is mental health, or if you're honest with your donors about what you're going through, it's all going to fall apart. But that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that actually most times it's not the way. And, and I'll tell you, this is an example from a, from the private sector, but there's a, there's a guy named Andy Dunn, who is the co-founder and CEO of Bonobos. Uh, I just, he just joined my, um, my accelerator class on Tuesday. He talked to us about mental yeah. health. So yes. So Andy, Andy, we're doing a bunch of stuff with Andy and Andy has this amazing story. So Andy, you know, Andy built what was one of the first really successful models of direct to consumer, digitally native businesses selling pants on the internet, and then eventually sold the business to Walmart. And he had a book that came out about 10 days ago, um, where it, it's the story, uh, it's called burn rate. And it's a story of him building bonobos while managing his own bipolar diagnosis. And the book is the first time he's coming out publicly about, about his own diagnosis and the journey. And, you know, in, in the book, I won't give away the whole book, but, but he tells this story at the, at the end, which was, um, you know, he was basically, he was diagnosed when he was 20 years old, when he was at Northwestern, he had his first manic episode. And then he went like more than 10 years without another episode. And then he's at the height of bonobos you know, it, it's like he's in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and it's like the hottest thing since sliced bread. And he has his next manic episode and he ends up going to the hospital. He ends up going to jail for a night. And and when he comes out, he has to call the board of all the top investors uh, and tell them what happened. And he's so he describes being so scared of having to, he thought he was going to lose everything. And this is like year eight of the like 10 year journey of bonobos and when he disclosed to the board what happened 
The first person who jumped in is a guy named Joel Peterson, who was the chairman of JetBlue. And he jumped in immediately when, after Andy disclosed it and said, um, Andy, it's okay. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that I work with who, who deal with this. How's Manuela, his girlfriend, now wife, how's Manuela doing? And immediately all of the, the whole board went around and basically did the same thing. And the point is, is that like most entrepreneurs would say the exact same thing about their investors. There's no way I could do that. If you talk to Andy, he would say it was one of the most freeing moments of his life because once it was out on the table, everybody could work with it and figure out how to how to make it a successful venture. So I, I think that there is a real lesson in that and that and that people's perceptions of how other people respond may not actually turn out to be the case if you take the plunge. Yeah, an awesome story. Like I mentioned, we just got to talk with him on on literally two days ago. <laughs> it's funny you bring that up. And I think that was definitely the message we took home. I, Rachel, I'd love to hear these stories are helpful and it's great to have context and examples, but DEI, and I know you have a deep background in this, is such a huge part of how you think about supporting your employees. It goes so much more than just hiring diverse people. Mm -hmm. um, how can leaders and organizations be mindful of um, making sure whatever their burnout initiatives or mental health initiatives are, are meeting the full spectrum of staff and employees where they are? Yeah, that's a good question. And honestly, I think you'll never really know because I think it's an evolving uh, bar, to be honest. Like some days it's going to be down here. Some days it'll be up here, some years, some months, whatever that looks like. Um, I do always recommend that people work both with internal hires and external consultants just because uh, when you're looking at an issue, it's not like I'm going to sit here and I tell you I have depression or I struggle with anxiety. I'm going to just deal with it on my own. Like, no, I'm going to go seek help. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I'm working with um, other professionals who have had many years with this um, to help uh, develop a plan for me that is also unique. Um, so with that, yeah, it's like I would I would alongside asking companies to do their own kind of barometer checks, like asking uh, employees, like, what do they want? What do they need? Uh, taking some temperature checks with some cultural surveys, um, having ERGs on board, making sure that even your meetings are set up in a way that makes sense. So like if you're starting a meeting, having an agenda that's set out ahead of time, making sure that, you know, there's like an opening question of like, if you could describe your mood as the weather today, what would that be, right? So really bringing in that human element is always ideal. Um, and then of course, like being able to work on this together. So if you have a vision, if you have some objectives that you want to uh, accomplish in the next three to five years, like let's, let's work on that. Because a lot of times I think companies will want to do something that will get fixed in six months. When the reality is we are just now trying to figure out what we're doing with mental health in a way that is tangible and we're seeing efforts that is not going to be fixed even in a year. You'll definitely see some improvements, um, but we're talking about something that is at least five, 10 years from now, but we have to do the work now. We have to kind of put those bricks one by one now um, so that we, when we're having this same conversation 10 years from now, it's going to be more about like, wow, we haven't seen burnout in forever. What does that look like? You know, so we're kind of flipping that conversation. Um, and I think too, whether you, if you're a CEO, like let's say you're hopefully there for a, a little bit or a while or a leader at a company, um, as I mentioned, it's going to take some time. So just having that same mindset of, whatever goal you're setting out to do now, it's just, it's going to evolve. Like this is version one. So be comfortable with uh, trying to adapt when you need to. Um, what we're dealing with today are what I, um, I got this term, I believe from Resma Menikin, who's the author of my grandmother's hands. Yeah. Um, but this uh, topic around the idea of micro traumas, our bodies are not meant to ex absorb all of what is happening. <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so with that in mind, how can you also leave that wiggle room for micro traumas that happen every day for people to show up um, so that you, you can change the barometer, what that looks like of how we're hitting our DEI standards. And you, again, get to determine what that is for your company. What the DEI standards are for um, Pond will be different for the DEI standards of whatever your company is. And that's okay. Um, there's no need to compare yourself to another company. Just compare yourself to yourself year after year. 
Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that because I could definitely go on about that forever. Something that you brought up that I, I just want to make sure we hone in on is um, making sure you have resources and answers when you do open that door. Mm. Because I mm. think something else that can be bad is you're like, oh, this is safe space. Everyone share. And what if someone brings something really serious to you? And you're like, oh, well, I'm not even sure what our health insurance covers, but like get a therapist. <laughs> like that's, yeah. a, you know, that's a really bad reaction instead of being like, we have ready, like we know exactly how our insurance coverage works and here's how you can access therapy and here's who's in network and who might be like appropriate. Like that sort of knowledge of the door you're going to open, I think is really important as a leader and not being just like, you know, we're going to have this conversation and then push people to be really vulnerable and not be ready to support them. Definitely. And I, I mean, this is a good point to mention too for everyone, both uh, corporate or private sector or nonprofit sector, like do an audit of your internal systems. What does it look like to hire someone? What does it look like for orientation? What does it look like if you're using a recruiter? What does your health insurance policy look like? Like this is the time if you haven't done it already to do so, because all of your systems, these are just like, these are pillars, right? Um, and then what you decide to hold up or put in between those pillars, um, that's up to you. But if your pillars are rocky and they're falling apart, <laughs> then that's not going to set up any of your employees for success or your company for a long term success. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this is a really good time now to kind of think about like I you want. I'm sure a lot of companies had hard conversations in June 2020. I put quotation marks around that because it was easy in June of 2020 to be like, wow this is messed up, what's going on in the world, we need to support Black Lives Matter, we need to do X, Y, Z. Um, and there are probably some employees that sat there were just like, well, I still feel uncomfortable. The CEO is saying this mm. and has this whole letter, but I still feel uncomfortable in my own workspace. Fantastic, you open that door, now what are you going to do? And a lot of companies now are kind of backtracking um, to see what support they can put in place to make up for mistakes from that time period and, and many years before. And to best point, we see a lot of people leaving and also being choosy about where they want to work because they've been through a certain experience before. So now the standards are much higher of where they want to go to have that support. So they are not repeating cycles of abuse. They're not repeating cycles of burnout. They're not repeating cycles of psychological harm. Um, so yeah, it's a big topic. And a lot of what we're talking about today with pre uh, pre prevention of burnout really starts with what structures that you have and how your structures can improve. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there was a question that came up in the chat a little earlier that I wanted to bring in here for you, Beth, about you know asking about technology. Because I think as, as Rach brought up systems and an audit and evaluation, and I know Beth, your work sits right at this intersection of digitization um, of nonprofits and employee well-being. Um, where do you see technology being utilized effectively um, in burnout prevention and, and supporting folks' mental health? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I want to say that technology alone doesn't do it. <laughs> technology is simply a tool and it's one of the levers, one of the pillars. It's really important to have leadership <laughs> and also to examine a, a, a workplace culture, um, a, a, as Rach was talking about. And I think uh, in the cultural area, uh, to connect it back to what Rach was talking about, um, uh, I, I, you know, I think a lot of things that cause burnout are, are white work norms. I'll just say it. OK. And that's things like perfectionism and honoring tasks over relationships and the sense of urgency and valuing the written word, all of those things and, and how those things manifest. They might manifest themselves with round the clock emails. Right. Um, trying to get in as many meetings as possible. So they're all crammed in back to back without giving it, you know, a breath or having to like edit and re-edit and re-edit and don't send it out. Oh my God, there could be a mistake in this sort of sense of perfectionism. And we really need to kind of uh, take a look at those <laughs> um, and, 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 and look at shifting that. And that, you know, is a leadership challenge and it's a workplace culture change challenge um, where technology comes in and can help um, address the burnout a, a couple of ways. I just wrote a book about this called The Smart Nonprofit. Smart tech, which is advanced digital tech that uh, helps make decisions and automates tasks, um, can really be useful to get to kill off the grunt work. Okay, uh, you know we didn't come into the sector to do spreadsheet aerobics, <laughs> cutting and pasting, and a lot of manual work, and that's exhausting. 
And if we start to move uh, as part of our plan to uh, address workplace burnout issues, you know, if there's an automation piece, is there a way that we can remove some of this grunt work, not to eliminate a reduced headcount, but really to make space so people can shift that time that they're cutting and pasting into relationships, you know, building relationships with donors or with other staffs, or even to take a five minute break between meetings. Come on, people, let's have that 10 minute buffer time. It's good for us, you know? Um, so, so, so that's one way. There are some other evolving smart tech tools that can analyze cultural norms and, uh, and help you detect uh, and shift uh, where things need to shift culturally. And, um, and lots of tools around HR. HR can be a problematical when it comes to uh, diversity and inclusion. You have to be really mindful because it could actually be discriminatory. But there are, there's one tool I'm thinking of, it's called uh, You Involve. And it actually, it's a smart tech tool that will analyze job descriptions and point out different coded languages that may, you may be saying in your job description, oh, this is, this, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, this is a, a burnout bin, if you will, or it's a toxic culture. And that can actually give you some clues to start to work on it. So, so there's lots of opportunity for for tech to help address this issue of burnout, but it's not you don't lead with it, and it has to be very human centered, and there also has to be a strategy um, around leadership support and also culture change. Yeah. If I could, if I could just build on that, Mitch, you know, there's also even simpler tech things, which is like you know, and Mitch, you, I'm sure had a similar experience in your in your prior life. Like most companies run an employee opinion survey. Some run it once a year, some run it once a quarter. I mean, you, the cadence, it doesn't really matter what the cadence is exactly. If you look at most employee opinion surveys, they have they have not caught up to include substantive questions about mental health. Yes. They ask about everything, but they don't ask about mental health. I can't tell you how many companies I see where, you know, at best, you got one question in there, and the one question is something like, um, "How would you say that your emotional well-being is healthy?" And it's like that mm -hmm. is not. First of all, it's not an evidence-based way to right. capture the mental well, health. Gonna, of your are good people going to answer that, right? <laughs> right, right. There's, there's, there's a lot of, and so there's even a more fundamental piece, which is like organizations, whether they are for profit or nonprofit, are they even collecting the data? so that they can do something about it. And it's not really that hard. Like you can use Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey and really basic stuff. But if you don't have a institutionalized mechanism for collecting the data and having some understanding of how your own workforce is doing, then it becomes a lot harder to think about a tech stack and evolving the ways of working of the team if you don't really have depth of understanding of what the core problems are beneath the surface. You're on mute, Mitch. <laughs> oh man, I haven't done that in a while. Um, I was saying there's two really great points and I just wanna add two quick things on the, on the technology front. One, you know, if you know you've got a problem and you're not sure exactly what the solution is, that's like exactly what Pond is here for. So like bring those to us and let us help you connect you with solutions and make it easier. And second, we have a lot of resources on how to make sure you're taking on a new piece of technology. Like Beth said, that is not, that's not the end. That is the beginning. And you need to make sure you're also supporting your staff that is trying to take on new pieces of technology because it could also just be a burden adding to their burnout and their mental health challenges as opposed to something that's helping it. So just two quick things I would wanna, wanna point out. Bill, I was also curious to hear from you, for people in this space, we know we're all at higher risk, right? For folks at nonprofits that themselves and their teammates and their bosses or their, you know, their employees are all at higher risk being in this work. What are some of the early signs to detect burnout? Like how can you know when you've got an issue on your hand with an individual, obviously it's all these cultural elements we've talked about, but if someone is going through a particularly hard time and it's hard for them to say it directly, what are some of the classic red flags? 
Yeah. Well, I, I would say, and, and Beth, you, you might, you might um, be better positioned. I'll just caveat at the beginning. I'm not a clinician. So, you know, I, I'm coming to this through the lens of somebody who does um, mental health advocacy work, but, you know, it's really in many respects sort of an answer for, for clinicians. But generally speaking, what you really see is people beginning to withdraw more broadly from the workplace, irritability, withdrawing, not feeling much sense of fulfillment in the, in the work that they're engaged in sleep. It can impact your sleep. Um, you know, there's a bunch of signals around this. And I think one of the big challenges that we have, and the reason why I keep going back to this is, you know, if we're struggling with this at public companies that have a lot of resources, then like everybody else is further behind. Like if you think about it, it's, it is the case at most public companies that while we train managers on all kinds of issues, we actually don't train them on mental health, how to spot the signs for themselves, for their colleagues, what to do about it. If you talk to managers, they'll actually often say that they end up not engaging with their teams because on one hand, they want to tell people that anything you say, I will keep confidential. So don't worry. You can open up to me. I'll keep it confidential. On the other hand, they also feel some obligation to a colleague that if they're really struggling, they want to be able to go get help for them. But those two things are at odds. And most managers essentially don't know how to navigate that contradiction. And so then they step away and don't really engage in the issue in a meaningful way. And so I think like, you know, one of the big opportunities that exists is that we need to think about how we even train the next generation of leaders, how to spot the symptoms of the of, of of all the sort of sort of mental health issues you can be dealing with, but also then how to engage um, pragmatically and empathetically on these on these issues. Because if if your core response is essentially this is so complicated that I'm not going to engage, all you're doing is brushing it under the under the table under the rug. But I don't know, Beth. What do you what do you think? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go briefly. Then I'll also uh, invite Rach into it because I know you said that you are getting your degree in mental health counseling. So I'm sure uh, you could talk about it from a, a mental health diagnostic perspective. But there are standardized workplace burnout diagnostics. In fact, um, I developed one for nonprofits specifically in the Happy Healthy nonprofit, which was based on thousands of interviews <laughs> with people who worked at nonprofits who were experiencing burnout and talking to them about their symptoms. Symptoms. I think my co-author and I got PSTD after doing all those interviews. And um, so they fall into four buckets. There are physical symptoms. Um, there are emotional symptoms, um, uh, short fuses, irritability, uh, overreacting. Um, there's also uh, attitudinal, <laughs> like having like, lack of motivation, having a negative attitude. Um, and then, of course, it then impacts work performance. Uh, you're, you're not as efficient, concentration levels. And so our Happy Healthy Nonprofit Burnout Assessment, uh, it's a set of, uh, it's not a medical diagnostic. It's really educational to help you understand what those symptoms are. And it gives you a score and you fall in, because um, burnout kind of happens in a gradual way over time. And at first you're fine, you're passion driven, but if you don't like have systems in place or, uh, or, or take care of yourself or have a work life outside of work, then, you know, the next level we call it, uh, you know, there's just a slight feeling. You might be a little irritable. You know, you might be one of those people who's working weekends, but maybe it's a little bit harder to get up and get that work done on a Saturday, right? But you do it. And if you don't take a break, if you don't like noticing what's going on, you get up to this next level. Maybe you have you catch a cold. Maybe you're you know you're, you're having anxiety or you know a number of other symptoms. And if you don't pay attention to that and address it, you get up to this passion depleted. And here you are burned out, and you're not good to yourself. You're not good to your family, your organization, or the people you serve. And when you get up to that higher level of burnout, I call it the red zone. It's harder to bounce back. It takes longer. Um, and, but it's different than I would say a mental health diagnostic or a physical examination from your doctor. I'll let, I'll pass it to Rach to talk a little bit more about that. Well, I actually want to say too, that you both, Phil and Beth, you both actually kind of 
nailed it on the head there. And I think the only thing I would also add is that, you know, what we do on the small scale replicates what we do on the larger scale. Something we haven't talked about yet is that this is still very individual focus where when we talk about mental health, like we also need to bring in that co collective energy effort. Um, so what does that look like to make sure that you have the resources for, uh, to care for your benefits like at home, like with your friends, with your family, your chosen family, whatever that looks like for you. Um, and making those connections with uh, colleagues in the workspace as well. Uh, because ultimately, uh, as you mentioned, Beth, like a, probably a lot of us are in that red zone where it's going to take us years to get back to whatever that is. And really, maybe we should even change that language to just um, it's going to take us years to get to a place of where we feel that stability um, versus right. like getting back to some thing. Um, but the only thing I would add uh, be beyond that too, is that, um, burnout and mental health and, uh, organizational structures, a lot of this will can, can, and should relate to how we are also taking care of each other. It's so easy for us to tap out as an individual, but it's also important for us to make sure that, um, we have resources to lean on other folks and vice versa. I mention this all the time when it comes to like activism, you, that you should never stop. You may need to take a break <laughs> but because you're not going outdoors to the um, protest today. That doesn't mean that you can't like make phone calls or make meals or whatever that looks like. Right. Uh, it's more so that you're just, you have a system in place that you're able to tap in, tap out when you need to um, so that you aren't really experiencing that compassion fatigue that um, we kind of brought up as well. But yeah. Can, can I add just one thing? Because what you brought up is so important about the aggregate and, and thinking about like these uh, burnout assessments. They are individual tools for education. But if you can get that aggregate data, they are quantified, then you can it can give an organization, a, stripping out all the privacy information, of course, but it can give you a sense of like, what is morale? <laughs> and what are some times of the year when we, uh, you know, when we are facing burnout and we can actually start to predict it and we can actually take action to mitigate it. Um, so it's kind of like this stuff we do for the individual, but then there's also that collective piece, whether it's organizational or in community. For sure. For sure. And I think something that the pandemic has probably taught a lot of us is that we should know our neighbors <laughs> um, because you never know how much you're going to need them for whatever reason. Uh, so I, yeah, this is, I know we're close to time, but like, this is definitely an important tangent to think about. And I can um, provide some resources for the uh, uh, write up after. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we only have a few minutes left as suspected. I knew this would not be enough time to cover everything we wanted to today. We had a number of questions that were submitted in advance and, I, and a lot of them were about that. Like I'm on staff, like how do I make these changes? Um, how do I ch push culture change? What if I want a 60 minute meeting should really only need to be 45 minutes? Like, how do I start making these proposals? I think we've covered some of those things here. I would just add like a really easy way would be you can share this session with your boss or with people on your team. And then it's, you don't have to deliver the message. It's from these awesome three people here that are able to give them some insight and they probably will hear it differently. It'll land differently when they hear it from an outside perspective and takes the pressure off. So definitely feel free to do that. This session will be live after, or will be available afterwards on YouTube, on LinkedIn. We put it into a summary that we'll post on Sunday. And in a few weeks, it'll be in our podcast stream as well. So just want to make sure that was really clear. Um, before we wrap, we only have about two minutes left, but I'd love to just go around and get like final word from each of you. You know, what do you, what do you want to be the takeaway? What are you taking away personally from this conversation um, for the audience today? Phil, if you want to kick us off. Um, I, I think my my takeaway or my final word would basically be that I think that everybody, even the youngest worker um, at a nonprofit or a for-profit has the ability to impact how the organization operates in surprising ways. I, I actually um, do believe greatly that there is this generational difference that exists between an older generation that's oftentimes running organizations and has a slightly older view of mental health and the younger generation for whom it's been a lot more topical in their in their lives and what i've seen is every time that you've had colleagues no matter how young they are or what part of the organization they work in lead with vulnerability it always 
has an impact even on people who have slightly outdated views on the issue. And so to me, it's actually, I'm very optimistic and hopeful about the power that people have if they lead with authenticity and vulnerability. Awesome. Thanks. Beth? Uh, I. I want to kind of take away from this um, that the importance of really centering well-being, and even if it requires, uh, especially leaders, to redefine our definition of productivity, that really, you know, it's not just tasks, it's also relationship and feelings and uh, really contribute to get the way we get things done. And we really need to make space for that. And we need to approach it with, um, with a, you know, upping our empathy skills, <laughs> being very human centered and, um, and having a lot of patience as we navigate through the years ahead. Yeah. All right, Rach, bring us home. <laughs> yeah. Um, so beyond obviously uh, being human centered, I love what Beth just said, like, let's also ch let change the way that we develop our structures. Um, so they are actually helpful um, and evolutionary versus um, just kind of the same old, same old. Um, so that's the one thing you can take away from this. Like, what can you, what's one change you can make today to make your systems and your structures better for you, yourself, and um, your employees? Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to our speakers. This was fantastic. Um, we do these every week, every Thursday at noon. We host these webinars and nonprofits that attend or leaders at nonprofits, make sure you give us feedback. We will put credit in your pond account. It's a really easy 50 bucks to make for taking some time to invest in yourself. So please do that and check out all the resources and, and offers we have on pond for you. Thank you again.